and um, Luke kicked us off firstly with talking about God's will for our lives. There was a difference there between the natural will and God's will for our lives and how Jesus followed God's will and he was obedient even to the point of death. Um, Andy, last week, he looked at how Jesus showed compassion towards people. He was looking at particularly grace and truth and how we need to be full of grace for somebody, for people, but as well as not neglecting the truth, right? And so today I just want to look at how Jesus wants us to serve others through having the spirit of humility. Now we don't talk a lot about humility, pride and humility a lot, um, but I just feel like it's something that I'm actually working through and I thought, well, you know, I'm just going to be honest and open and this is me and it's just going to be a simple message. <coughs> and I've entitled it Dusty Feet, which will become explain, explain, ex, go on, that's the one, later on. <laughs> All right, so if you've been coming, or if you know me and Luke quite well, or been coming for the last few weeks, we've, we've had a new addition to our family. Sorry, it is another dog illustration, but it is our life at the moment. And um, what we thought was our, an already lively family that we had, this new addition has now brought even more so life into our family. And um, as if it weren't even lively enough, this dog is, has changed our family life. And um, if you know me, I'm not a very, I'm very squeamish sort of person. So I don't do things like vomit, excrement, um, the nose region. I don't do any of that kind of thing. It's just not me. I'd gip. Don't, Sarah, yeah, we're the same. We, we just don't deal with things like that very well. Um, so it came to a point where one day me and Jared took him for a walk. And I don't mind going for a walk. I quite enjoy the time out in the fields and... And um, we took him for a walk, and I, I actually honestly think that two months into having him, having Bernie, I didn't have to clear up any of his poo. I got away with it. It was great until that one day where he decided that he wasn't going to do it in the field off the path in the woods. He wasn't going to do it at that moment. He was going to do it on the path of a very, very main road, busy main road, the buses coming back and forth, and it was so embarrassing. You know, it's your first time doing it in front of public. I was so embarrassed, I could feel my face going red, and I had my bags ready, and Jared was just laughing his head off at me gipping as I'm trying to pick it up, and five bags later, I've got all these bags, and it wasn't the solidness of it either. It was, oh, you know, you, anyway, I'm sorry if you're squeamish. <laughs> Five bags later, and then I'm, I'm picking as I'm going to pick the last, what I thought was the last of it. My nails just pierced the bag. And <laughs> it was everywhere. Oh, and I, oh, I just wanted to go home. We're not having him anymore, Luke. <laughs> I don't do dog poo. I don't do it. But I have done it since. <laughs> I'll leave it for Luke. That's his job. Anyway, get that visual out of your head. Um, sometimes, what, where am I going with it? Sometimes we, we look at jobs that needs to be done and we think, oh, I'm not picking that up. Oh, I, I don't want to do that job. Oh, that job's a bit beneath me. It's not in my job description, that job. Um, I'm not doing that. You might see it and choose to ignore it and just walk on by. Or, Am I the only person who thinks that? Yeah. No, come on. <laughs> You are all full of pride right there. <laughs> we know that serving one another is a good thing to do, right? Jesus came to serve, not to be served. So if we want to model ourselves on Jesus, then why does serving sometimes become so difficult, so hard for us to do? What are the struggles that we face? Serving people comes very naturally to some people. I've got my, one of my best friends, she's, she's so good at just dropping everything and running to meet a need, and she's all about that and meeting needs and that. I find it quite difficult to drop everything and see to a need. It's just me. I'm not the only one. I know there's some of you out there who, who is, finds it a little bit more challenging. Um, I think you would agree, though, that wherever we find ourselves, we can always do a bit better at loving people, at showing Jesus through the things that we do and things are meeting their needs. So the text today, we're going to look at John 13 and, and we see just right at this moment, Jesus has lived right up to this moment, the moment before he is crucified on the cross. He is living 
up to this moment. And all these emotions are going on inside of Jesus. Like, I'll just summarize it in a whole a day in the life of Jesus. Like, on Monday, he goes into the temple, and he's angry at what he sees. He, see, he upturns all the tables. He sees all this money changing going on, and, and people wheeling and dealing. He's, he's mad, and he, he's, ch- he's turning the tables upside down. On Tuesday, we see him in a big debate with the re- religious leaders. On Wednesday, there's no record, actually, of what happens on Wednesday, but I can imagine he would needed very much some uh, chill-out time, some downtime after two very hostile days. On Thursday, we see him gathered in the upper room with his disciples, with his friends at the Last Supper, and he's at the point of delivering his final famous speech. We've just remembered, haven't we, this morning, about his body and his blood, the bread and the wine. He's about to give that. And can you imagine all the emotion that he's feeling right there? He knows that he is about to be betrayed by his friend that's just sat next to him. He knows that he knows that he's going to next day be tortured and, and betrayed and crucified. Can you imagine the emotion? And you thought you had a bad week. <laughs> Jesus was facing all that. And then Luke's gospel, it says that during this meal, a, a heated argument was arising within the disciples. Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm the greatest. You can imagine John the Baptist. He was up, he was John, and he was saying, well, it's going to be me. I'm going to be the greatest, obviously, because he loves me. I'm the greatest. And then you've got Peter piping up. Uh, no, I walked on water. I'm the brother. I'm the greatest. It's got to be me, surely. And the others are like, yeah, but Peter, you sank. What's that all about? And Bartholomew, what have you done? <laughs> you know, you can imagine the discussion that's being had within the disciples. Jesus looks around the room at that moment and says, and thinks to himself, he rolls his eyes and thinks, I've, I've told them this lesson before. We've been here before, lads. So haven't you got it yet? In that moment, he looks around the room and sees proud hearts and dusty feet. And in verse 5, it's on the screen here behind me, it says, So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. You know, it was custom back in those days. If you went to a house in Jesus' time, it was custom for you to be greeted with a kiss, and you were offered to have your feet washed. Um, uh, if you came to my house, I can guarantee I will not be washing your feet. <laughs> Paul Cousins would never come to my house again if I offered to wash his feet. He hates feet. Um, well, in our culture today, we don't do things like that. We may take our shoes off, but we may offer to take their coats and invite them in and um, make them a cup of Yorkshire tea or a cup of coffee or a biscuit if you like them. In that moment, Jesus looks around the room and sees proud hearts and dusty feet. And what does he do? He puts the apron on. He gets the bowl. He pours the water into the bowl. And everyone in that moment just stops. What's he doing? What's Jesus doing? You can't do that. That's humiliating. That's the lowest of the low jobs. In in those times, the host who would wash the feet of people would not do it. They would get their servants to wash the feet because it was too humiliating a task to do. What's Jesus doing? What's he doing that for? Jesus, no, you can't do that. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You're our deliverer. You are the light of the world. You are um, the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are our deliverer. You can't do that. But in that moment, Jesus takes that opportunity, he kneels down, and he gets low. Does the lowest of the low job in society. He sees the need. Their feet are dusty. He loved them to the end in doing something that everyone else thought was too low to be done. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. Jesus knelt down and washed feet. I'm not doing that job. It's a bit beneath me. Oh, it's not in my job description, that. Oh, oh, I'm I'm too busy to do that. I'll do it later. Oh, I know somebody else who could do that job. I'm not picking the poo up. I'm not going to wash feet. What is it, though? What is it that really stops us from being true servants like Jesus was demonstrating? 
well, we put it down to pride, isn't it? It's pride. And so I just wanted to expound a little bit on what that means and what that looks like for our lives. How can we live a life of humility? How can we get rid of the pride in our lives? Boy, pride is dangerous, actually. It is um, the last thing that people admit to. They can't see it. It's a lack of love. It's criticism. It's judgment. Thinking highly of ourselves, like the disciples were doing. Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? Pride is, and boasting go together. In fact, it describes boasting as um, a practice of quackery. Quack, quack. It's a horrible sound, isn't it? Quack, quack. Squawking. It's a horrible sound. Pretending to be something that we're not. If anything, we should be boasting about the goodness of God and what he's done for our lives. We are nothing without him, are we? Luke was saying that earlier. It's, we're just nothing without him. I'm proud. I'm, I'm proud of my children. I'm proud of my husband. I'm proud of this church. And, um, but every single day, I always need to acknowledge who is Lord. That it's always God. Our, our core value, our first core value is always God. I'd be foolish to think that I could pull off this life on my own. I just, I am nothing without God. Humility, though, is powerful and sometimes is looked as a bit of a weakness, but it's, it's powerful. Humility doesn't mean that it's a weakness. It's actually a great strength. A humble person doesn't think highly of themselves. They ought to think, actually, they, they don't even think le- too less of themselves either. They just don't think too much about themselves. God has called us to be bold and courageous. That's what humility is, true humility is being bold in Christ. Now, the devil, we know that is the total opposite. He he is full of the spirit of pride. And uh, we see in Isaiah 14, it should be on the screen, I think, it says, where it's talking about the fall of Satan. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon, I will ascend above the top of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. It's I, 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 isn't it? The devil is all about himself. It's me. I'm going to be seated up there. I'm I'm the highest. But then God says, but you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. Harsh. (laughs) When we lift ourselves up, he's very capable of bringing us down, not to that extreme maybe, but you get what I'm saying. The widow's offering that reminded me of that, to be having a spirit of humility. The Pharisees were giving all their wealth away. Look what I can put in here. Look at all this, my wealth I'm putting here. Aren't I good? Aren't I good at doing this? Look at me. And then we see the widow just coming alongside and just doing her thing and just putting it, her last two coins or whatever it was in. Now, she had a spirit of humility. And also Jesus was told another story about the wedding feast in Luke 14. Um, It says, when someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you'll have to take the place, the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that your host comes. He will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honoured in the presence of other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. If we don't humble ourselves, then he'll actually probably do it for us, and that is a really challenging lesson to learn, isn't it? Proverbs 16, 8, it says, First pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. It's better to live humbly among the poor than to live it up among the rich and famous. I don't know about you, but I don't want money to be higher than God. I don't want popularity to take further place than God. I don't want um, uh, power to, to have a higher place than God. God has to be first in our lives, right? Jesus was the greatest servant of all. He humbled himself and didn't purposely draw attention to himself. It wasn't about the act of service. He became a servant. 
at this point, I need. Um, Luke, just, just jump up here for us, please. You're always up for being up here. <laughs> Humbly. <laughs> so I've just been talking about um, not elevating ourselves higher. And I don't know about you, you might know some people, maybe in this room, dare I say, or other people who are not here, or I don't know. I think all of us can know a person who is like this. But I call these people selfie servants. What I mean by that is I'm washing his feet. <laughs> selfie servants. They're actually doing a good thing, brilliant thing, but look what I'm doing here. I'm doing a good thing here. And actually, they are doing a good thing. But actually, they're taking away the glory of God, yeah. what he deserves. And actually, it's better to do it in secret than it is to show off, basically. <laughs> look what I'm doing. It's not about us. Thanks. <laughs> it's about making a difference in people's lives, meeting their needs, serving God for his glory, not for how many likes that we get for doing it, right? And this is the line that, if anything, you want you to remember today. Serving is not about what we do. It's about who we are. Serving is not about what we do. Serving is about who we are. We may never see the outcomes when we do good deeds. I think about the people who serve in the food bank. Um, they see clients that come in and out, and, and they're making a difference. They, they make a difference to people's lives. Um, but they may never see what happens to them. And um, we, our prayer is that they go on to connect with Jesus and know him for themselves. It's all about giving out in our actions. Out of our gratefulness to God, we give back to him. Always God, right? Core value, always God. But serving one another, as Jesus was teaching his disciples, we serve one another, which is our second value, is always people. And I notice, actually, it's the first two commandments, isn't it? Love the Lord your God. And the second one is, love your neighbor as yourself. Always God, always people. There were countless people in the Bible who always gave back to God. They saw the miracle and the provision happen, and they always gave back to God. There's just a few listed here. There's Miriam. She sang and danced her heart out after they crossed the Red Sea. Hannah, giving birth to a son. David, winning his battle with the Philistines. Solomon, thanking God's provision to build the temple. David's countless psalms. Elizabeth for John the Baptist. Mary for Jesus. Jesus, countless times, always gave thanks to God first, and then the miracle happened. The leper whom Jesus healed. And then Paul as well, who thanked God for the Philippi people in partnering with him in sharing the gospel. Everything was about God. They remained with a good attitude, remained humble, was mindful about giving God the glory. To keep humble, we need to be continually thanking God, always praising him, always, like we've done this morning. I was overcoming worship this morning, and I don't actually get to do that a lot. <laughs> I, was just, I was just, probably because I've been doing this and preparing this, and it's always about God. It's never about us, is it? And I, in that moment, I just thought, we're just so not, nothing. Look at you, just, you died for me. I was so humbled. He was humbled, even to the point of death. Thank you, Lord. God will do whatever you need him to do if we humble ourselves, and lean on him, and put our trust in him. If we humble ourselves. How much do we seek God for humility? We don't do it. It's not on top of our prayer list. God, humble me today. Show me where I need to be humble. It's just, it's not, is it? And if you do, <laughs> it is a challenging thing. He will show you. Um, Peter had a problem with pride. But once he sorted that, look what happened. 3,000 people got saved in a day. That was amazing. True humility is knowing who you're not, but also knowing who you are in Christ. Um, I like to, on a Sunday night, I like to swap diaries and we, we plan ahead for the week. And so we, we often, 
we use a Trello app. I don't know if you know what that is, but we use Trello and I write my lists. It's like an, um, an app that you have lists for every single day. And, and I love it. I love ticking off my jobs that I've got done. And I love that. And um, we sit and compare what's happening, who's got the car on what day, when can I go and see the person on that day, when can I meet them there, when can I do finances on that day. Do you know what I'm saying? I love to have, and I'm quite organised in the week. And, um, but if Luke phones me up, like, during the day, and I'm, I'm in, I'm busy doing my, my list, <laughs> and he says, right, Luke, we've got to go and see this person, they need to see us now. Uh, um, and actually, the need, it's very needful. It's very urgent. But in that moment, I'm thinking, oh, but I, I've got my list. I need to get that done, though. Oh, no, that means I'll have to stay up late to do that. <laughs> how, how selfish am I in that moment? Goodness me. I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm not saying, don't phone me at all, anyone. If you Please feel free to phone me. <laughs> I'll be there. Honestly, it's a work in progress. <laughs> I'm being honest, do you know. So um, I've lost my way. Here we go. But I, I do, I find it incredibly hard out of my very busy day, my busy schedule, that I've made plans and things crop up. In that moment, I'm thinking, that is the need. Jesus wants me to meet that need right there. What am I? I am nothing. It's always about God. I'm making myself sound really heartless, and I really do care, honestly. <laughs> really do care. How can I serve someone today? That has become one of my prayers every day. How can I serve you, Jesus? If, if I need to be interrupted, interrupt me. Inconvenience me so I can make a difference into someone's life. I never want to be in a position where God can't use me because I was too busy or the act of service was maybe too beneath me, maybe not my job description, I'll do that job. I never want to be in that place. Look what Jesus did. A few years into when we first started youth pastoring, um, we, took, we thought we had a great idea of taking a bunch of us away on a mission trip to Hungary. Some of you are here um, today. And um, we, it was a typical mission trip. Uh, we did outreach, we did painting buildings, we did um, spoken uh, church meetings and stuff. We were with Lavia Soper, I don't know if a lot of you know them, but him. But he's a great man who goes around and heals. He's a great, got a great gift of healing on his life. <clears throat> so we were doing that, and we'd finished doing a meeting one day, and we were on our way back, walking to the place where we were all staying. And... Um, and we were just chatting her in along, and then we were all walking. Then we, we turn back, and we see Becky. It was lovely, but lovely Becky. Becky is talking away to this little, imagine a typical Hungarian lady, old lady, crouched over, headscarf on, and she's talking to her, and we're like, does she know Hungarian? What's she talking to her about? We're like, all this confusion going on. What's she doing? Next minute, we see Becky crossing this little old lady across this main road, and it was, it was a very busy road, and we're like, oh, Becky, that's so nice. You, just thought you wanted to help her cross the road. That was really kind, really nice. And it wasn't Becky's fault that the lady actually didn't want to be led across the road. <laughs> Becky saw the need, and she was there. She was meeting the need, weren't you, love? <laughs> it wasn't her fault that she was chanting after you, weren't she? In Hungarian, whatever she was saying. Ah, I didn't want to be crossed over. <laughs> Bless her. She saw the need. Well done. <laughs> but when we get out of ourselves, when we tune our hearts, when we open our eyes to see the need before us, when we bring Jesus to people, maybe for you, it could be um, friends moving house and you think, oh, I'm a bit busy that day, but you know what? They've helped me before. I'm going to help them out. And so they help you, you move house with them. Or you take a meal to someone who is struggling with their health. Or maybe you babysit for parents who need much time on their own. Or you take the rubbish bin out um, one day. When you see it overflowing in church, you just take three minutes just to whip and change that. Or whatever what that looks like. When we humble ourselves and see people through Jesus' eyes. The act of service is not what we do. It becomes who we are. 
I remember a few months back when, you know, we rent on a Monday this hall out to Slimming World and the lady called Sarah who runs that, uh, she wasn't there this particular Monday. I was letting her in, I was showing her where the exits were and where to plug in stuff and health and safety and all that kind of thing. And um, I was just emptying the bins and making sure everything was clean and tidy for her. And she was bringing in all the paraphernalia that Slimming World brings in. It was immense boxes and she's had her husband tagging along with her. And I could see him talking and then she said, <laughs> then she shouted over, yeah, you need to go and ask the caretaker's wife over there, change the bins. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> I am not the caretakers. I'm not bringing down any caretakers in here. I'm not, I don't do that. I don't do this for a living, you know. <laughs> Gosh, in that moment, how selfish was I? How proudful was I? I don't do things like that. I'm not the caretakers, right? <laughs> I'm sure I'm not the only one, though. You've thought this before. I'm sure you have. You've all been there. But my prayer is, Lord, give me ears to hear those who are hurting, eyes to see the things that I don't, I'd normally overlook. Lord, give me a heart to care. God is there. If, God, if, if there is a need that I need to meet, help me just to pause. Help me to be interrupted and accept that interruption and meet the need and be Jesus to someone. We are a church who meets needs, right? This, that is the culture of our church. We are a need-meeting church. We are here to serve one another as Christ came to serve us. We are life givers. We are meat, need, meat. We are, I've got my tongue tied over. Right? <laughs> we are need meters. We are always about people. Always God and always people. Have the band up. That'd be great. When we serve others, when we wash their dusty feet, when we lay ourselves down, when we humble ourselves, God changes lives. And the first life that he changes is ours. We get the thrill of being used by God. We've just prayed, we, like we've done this morning, we've prayed for one another. We've made a difference today to somebody. I took the time out of my busy day. I made a big difference to somebody's life today. I just left a bag of shopping on someone's doorstep. They don't know it's me, but... I made a difference today. Every week I bring my neighbor's bin in. They don't know it's me, but I made a difference today. What does that look like for you? How can you make a difference into someone's life? Can you be interrupted? Do you welcome that? Shall we humble ourselves and meet people's needs and make a difference? Because serving is not what we do, it's who we are. The greatest is the one who is a servant, right? Am I a caretaker? Nope, but today I am. Am I a kid's worker? Nope, but today I am. Am I a house mover? Not really, but today I am. Am I meals on wheels for people? No, can't cook really, but today I am. Am I good at making coffee for others? Today I am. We're doing this for the glory of God. Because the greatest is the one who serves. Jesus looked around the room, saw proud hearts and dusty feet. And in that moment, demonstrated a humbling act of love. When you have eyes to see and spiritual ears to hear and a heart to care, you will see the needs that are set before you. And you'll never be the same again. Do you want to change your marriage? Start serving your spouse. Do you want to change your relationships? Start serving your friends. Do you, want to ser- do you want to change your church? Start serving in church. Do you want to change your community? Serve your community. Great opportunity next week, next Saturday, to love hands with at Richmond and Birklands. Serve the community. We want to change this place, wherever it is. <laughs> Sorry. Luke asked me to slip that one in there, but I couldn't remember where it was. <laughs> we want to make a difference. We want to serve one another. We are a church who meets needs. Serving is not what we do. It's who we are. Come on, let's stand. And I want us to apply that this week. Challenge yourself. Lord, help me to make a difference in someone's life. And you know what? Every single one of us can do that. It's easy. And all we have to do is just look. Open our eyes. And that should be our prayer every day that 
We are here to serve one another, to make a difference. And you making a difference will change someone's life. You don't know the seeds that you sow. It might connect them closer to Jesus. Come on, let's all close our eyes and we pray together. Father, I pray for every single one of us here. God, that you will open our eyes to see what you see. Lord, that you will open our ears to hear what you are hearing. God, help us to make a difference into people's lives. Help us to care. We thank you so much that you care for people. We thank you, Lord, that you humbled yourself to the point of death. And Father, we want to ask you, God, that you will help us to do that, that you will humble us. Lord, that you will take away the pride that was within us, Lord, just to stop and to make a difference into someone's life. God, this is always about you. All we do this is for you. God, it's never about us. We help us, God, if we ever get to that place. Jesus, we need you more and more in our lives. Thank you, Lord.